good afternoon. Thank you, Josh. What an honor it is to be here, to be a part of this program. I'm so thankful to uh, you who are members of this congregation and those who lead in planning and making this happen. You are a blessing, and you bless more folks than you are aware, a multitude folks and the number of people that are here. Uh, as Josh mentioned, it is my joy to work with my brother, to travel from place to place and uh, get to be around him. And uh, he, uh, Wayne introduced him yesterday and kind of made reference to a few things. And Jeff said, the reason nobody talks about us so badly is because nobody knows who we are. And what I wanted to tell Jeff then and what you approved today is that's absolutely right. So <laughs> I'm thankful that you've come in here. I have, I have a dear friend that travels around the country putting on a seminar called Becoming an Acts 2 Church. Becoming an Acts 2 Church. And isn't that really what we want to do? We want to be an Acts 2 Church. Isn't that kind of our dream? You think about Acts 2 and, and, and the book of Acts, those first five chapters and what it must have been like, must have been like to be alive at that time. I mean, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's gone back to be with the Father. This is the, the hub of Scripture. This is that which the prophets long to look into, Peter right? many years later. This is, this is that moment in time that all of time had waited for. This is that time. And, and Jesus had gone back, and before he left, he gave, them, he, he gave the disciples one instruction. Let me paraphrase. Go and tell everybody alive who I am. Go and tell everybody about me. That was the, the singular mission that they had. Tell everybody about me. And so it happens. Acts chapter 1, uh, 120 folks in an upper room, maybe fearful, maybe rejoicing of what was coming. We don't know all that would have been going on in their minds. And that, that, that 11 selects one, it becomes 120 people. I was a part of a, a church plant a few years back. We started with 40 people, and within just a matter of months, that 40 became about 100. It was an exciting, thrilling time. And then Acts chapter 2, Jews from every nation under heaven gathered, and 3,000 respond to Peter's command from the Lord. And the church grows from 120 to, to 3,000, or the church is born and becomes 3,000 people. Acts chapter 4, that 3,000 becomes 5,000 men. We don't know how many women or children were in that group. We know 5,000 men, uh, every church that I've ever worked with. There are more women than men. I don't know if there were more women than men in the first century in that first century church, but let's say there were at least as many, 10,000 people, maybe had children and maybe 15 or 20,000 people. Uh, turn the page, Acts chapter 5, verse 9. <clears throat> Multitudes were added to them, both men and women. So what are we now? 20,000, 40,000 people? And then... Acts chapter 5, again, the, in those days, the number of the disciples was multiplied. Are there 80,000 Christians in Jerusalem now? I, I do not know, and nor do you, but, but it's possible there are as many as 100,000 Christians in Jerusalem already. What a time. What an absolutely stupendous, amazing time to be alive and to be a Christian. And then Acts chapter 7 comes along. And Stephen preaches a sermon. You remember the sermon? Let me paraphrase it for you. God loves everybody. And in case you missed it, let me say it again. God loves everybody. And it made the people so mad that God loves everybody, they picked up stones and they started stoning Stephen. They stoned him to death. 
Uh, in my mind, when I was growing up and I heard stones, I pictured big boulders. And I used to wonder why Stephen didn't just outrun those boulders. But history says when they stoned somebody in the first century, they would have a pit or dig a pit, maybe two or three feet deep, and toss the person in there. And the, the stones were, were hand-sized stones, big stones, not humongous cinder block types. But big stones, they could throw at a person. Then you get to Acts chapter 8. And there's a problem that develops. There's an undercurrent of a problem that has developed. And, and, and maybe you have missed that problem. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've spotted it before. I, I had missed it for years. You, you remember what, what the command was in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? Begin in Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And when you get to Acts chapter 8, where are they? Jerusalem. They're still there. They hadn't done anything other than stay in Jerusalem. And, and frankly, I understand it. I, I imagine that if the church here at university or the congregation where you are, it suddenly went from 100 people or 200 or 300 people to, to 60 or 80,000 people in a matter of months, you probably wouldn't be leaving either, would you? It's very natural. But Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the problem the church in Acts chapter 8 is having is they have not done what Jesus told them to do. And so God uses the stoning of Stephen to, to shake things up. The last verse of chapter, last couple of verses of chapter 7, we're introduced to a guy by the name of of Saul, you will know him well in this audience, and the text tells us that the, those who are stoning Stephen laid their cloaks, their outer garments, at the feet of a young man named Saul. I don't know if they put those outer garments at Saul's feet because Saul was uh, so young that he did not need to bloody his hands with the murder of an individual, or if they put their cloaks at his feet because as Galatians will say, Paul was saying Galatians, he outselled all his peers. He was the leader among them, as they'll say in 2 Corinthians. And, and he was in charge of it. I don't know which it is, but that's where we meet him. In Acts chapter 8, those that were scattered, the text will tell us, as a result of the persecution that arose over, over Stephen, went everywhere, preaching the word. I hope you've got your Bible and you're with me in Acts. Uh, we're going we're to continue in that book, and I want you to notice some things here. It gives us an example of Philip. Now look what Philip does. He goes down to Samaria, the city of Samaria. These folks are different. They're not really Jewish, and they're not really not Jewish. They're kind of half Jews, half not Jews. They're not really sure what they are. They're not really sure what they're supposed to be doing. They're not fully Jewish. The Jews don't accept them, but they're not Gentile either. The Gentiles don't accept them. They're different people. And Philip tells them God loves them. And a number of them are baptized. And it is easy stuff for them to preach and teach and love those who are completely different than them. But stay in Acts chapter 8 and skip down to verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Arise and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert, a deserted place. And he rose and went, and there was a eunuch, uh, an Ethiopian, a court official of Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasury. Now if the Samaritans were different, this guy is even more different. That's a good phrase, and even more different. I mean, he's of a different skin color. He's of a different nationality. He speaks a different language. He's of a different social status. He is in the king, the queen's court. He's an important official. But they still don't get it. In fact, Acts chapter 8 will say that in the leader's minds, at least, this is still a sect of the Jews. And in fact, notice verse 27 that the eunuch isn't really that different. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Go to Jerusalem be at the temple. Uh, I remember from hearing my dad preach that uh, when he got to Jerusalem, he couldn't go in the temple because of his nationality. He wouldn't have been allowed in. He was a devoutly religious Jewish 
religious man. He was not Jewish in nationality. He was Jewish in religion. So when they let the Ethiopian in, they're just letting another Jewish guy in. Acts chapter 9. God changes the game as our boy Saul, breathing out threats and murder against the disciples, verse 1, goes to the high priest, verse 2, asks letters of the high priest that he finds any belonging to the way men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And you know the story, don't you? Bright light, loud voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But God said to him, well, God, as you know, appears to Ananias. And he says, Ananias, uh, you have the visitation card this week of a guy named Saul. And Ananias knew Saul. He remembered him. He said, well, you know, God, uh, I, I think I'm going to be busy this week. Could you give that visitation card to somebody else? And God said, no, Ananias, you got it. And so Ananias went as a reluctant soul winner. God said to Ananias, he's chosen to be my witness before, my messenger before Gentiles and kings. Can I put a stop here and tell you a story to kind of bring you back around? My son, Philip, married Laura. Laura's dad was a government official in Nashville. He was a, an accountant, a rather mild-mannered, quiet man, very quiet. He, he wouldn't make a scene. He would never stand in front of this audience and address it. I, I just thought he was just an accountant. A good guy, a good Christian man, just an accountant that did his work well and didn't make waves. But somewhere along the way, he had become friends with a guy named Phil Bredesen. You're not from Tennessee, so you won't realize that Mr. Bredesen became the mayor of Nashville. And when he became mayor of Nashville, he promoted David to the treasurer of the city of Nashville, Davison County in Metro Nashville. And then... He served eight years in that role, and then Bredesen ran for governor of the state of Tennessee. And Phil Bredesen served for eight years as the governor of the state of Tennessee, and he named his secretary of treasurer, David Manning, who became the secretary of treasurer. One day, a very rare day, it's happened maybe four times in our life, my son Philip and my other son Andrew and I were on the golf course. We golfed together just to hang out on a beautiful day, and we're about on golf's hole number seven, and our cell phone rings and Philip's cell phone rings and he answers it and it's his wife, Laura, and Laura says, Dad has had a medical episode. His lungs have collapsed. Philip rushes to the hospital as quick as possible. His brother Andrew and I stay around, gather the clubs, check out. I run by my house, get a shower and head to the hospital to be with my son and daughter-in-law. I get to the front desk at Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville and I asked to see David Manning, and the lady says, we don't have a David Manning. And I said, I, I know he was brought in here. Maybe he's in the ER still and hadn't been processed. Could you check? And she rings the phone, and no, we don't have a David Manning. And I thought, that's really odd. And my first thought, I'm sorry, thought of thought, says the preacher was, he's died, and so they don't have him listed. I thought, well, this is going to be really, really hard. Philip answered, and I said, is everything okay? He said, yeah, everything's fine. He said, they, he's, in, he's back in the ER being looked at. And I said, they said he's not here. They said he's under an assumed name. I said, really? Well, there was a reporter in Nashville didn't like him and always trying to dig up dirt on him. If they found out his hospital, they would have come and badgered the family. So I said, what's the name? They said, Bluefish Sorgill. Yeah. So I, I go to the front desk, and I said, I need to... The, the room number of Bluefish Swordgill. And they said, no problem. It's like, okay, what kind of world I'm in. So he was going to be put on the ninth floor. I went up to the ninth floor and the doors opened. And when the doors opened the ninth floor, there was a desk standing, sitting right there. And the man behind it was Bill Purcell, Bill Purcell the current mayor of Nashville. And I said, uh, Mr. Purcell was kind of surprised. He said, what is your business here? I said, I'm here to see, Day I'm here to see Bluefish Swordgill. And he said, what's your business with him? I said, well, I'm his preacher. Now, excuse me for that. I was using a little shorthand there. I'm really, he did not worship where I preached. He's my son's father-in-law. I am a preacher. I was there kind of in that capacity. I wasn't trying to lie. And this has probably been recorded, so I'm in trouble now. 
<laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you're not his preacher. And I thought, oh me, I found out how did he know. He said, his preacher just left. I, and so I explained it to him and he called back and I got to go back. It wasn't very many days later when Mr. Manning had had lung transplant surgery that Laura, my daughter-in-law, was in the room with him and the phone rang and she didn't answer it. He was on a ventilator but had a whiteboard and they could write back and forth and if they were writing, she was not going to be disturbed. After a few minutes, the phone rang again. She ignored it again. A few minutes later, a nurse came down the hallway and said, Miss Jenkins, there is a phone call for you. She said, well, Dad's awake right now. We're writing. Take a message. We'll get back with them. They said, no, no, you should take this call. She said, well, why don't you just have them call back later? And the nurse looked at my daughter-in-law and said, Miss Jenkins, it's the president. I thought, well, <laughs> Mr. Manning may not be as mild-mannered as I thought he was. The next day, Jeb Bush called and said, uh, uh, Miss Jenkins, uh, my brother George is in Guam right now, and he wanted me to call you and tell you that if you needed anything at all, that the Bush family would take care of it. Now, I tell you that story because I know that some of you are going to be impressed with it, not to be impressed with me. I had nothing to do with that, but to be impressed with the fact that when we get around people of importance, suddenly things kind of change. If you read the text with me a minute ago about what Saul was to be doing, he was going to be God's witness before, did you see it? Gentiles and kings. And we highlight in our mind, whether we mean to or not, the king part, and miss how important and significant the Gentile part here is. Because if you watch from Acts chapter to the birthday of the church, or the roll out the cake and blew out the candles, to Acts chapter 10, there is not a Gentile in the church. Nobody's become a Christian that's a Gentile. I mean, you've got a few Samaritans that aren't really sure what they are, and you've got Ethiopian, who is a Jew, who is a Jew by religion. There's, not, there's no Gentile. Well, God solidifies the deal. God wants to make this very clear. So turn the page of your Bible to Acts chapter 10, and here Peter shows on, up on the scene. And, you know, when Peter shows up, you know things, something exciting is going to happen. I wonder if they felt that way in the first century. Peter's here, just get ready. Something good is going to happen. Peter shows up in your book of Acts in chapter 10 after having disappeared for a little while from the book. And he, it's made clear, verse 15, that what was unclean, it's made clear to Peter, that what was unclean, God has made clean. And so a Roman officer is converted to Christ. Verse 34, a Gentile man, no doubt, a Roman officer. Peter opened his mouth, verse 34, and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no, no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. God the Spirit is going to make it clear beyond any shadow of a doubt that He wants Gentiles in His church. Verse 44, While Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And believers from among the circumcised, that's the Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed. They can't believe it. God's going to let Gentiles in now? I doubt it. I can't believe that. I can't imagine that. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on even the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? Now watch it. Who received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Peter makes reference back to Acts chapter 2. These people, all who became Christians had received the Spirit at that point. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and 39. But these people had received the Spirit just like the apostles had on the day of Pentecost. And so Peter commands them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. I would really don't have time for the side note, but for those who say the ultimate goal of the Christian is the Holy Spirit, I would remind you that these in Acts chapter 10, these Gentiles had received the Spirit, but they weren't saved yet. If they had been saved, Peter would not have commanded them to be baptized. Now go back. Go back to the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts. And you know what you'll read? 
You read Jews preaching Jewish sermons to Jewish people full of Jewish characters and Jewish stories and Jewish backgrounds in the temple and in the Jewish council, before the Jewish council and in the Jewish synagogues. But finally, in Acts chapter 10, God solidifies the deal. There is now no doubt Gentiles can be Christians. Build more church buildings. That's not what happened. But open the doors. Get ready. Buy more visitor packets. Gentiles are now welcome into the kingdom. And there is no doubt about it. From this point forward, it is settled and it's taken care of. Isn't that great? Isn't that marvelous? But chapter 11. Now the apostles and brothers who were throughout Judea, heard that the Gentiles also received the word of the Lord. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, they criticized, the circumcised party criticized him, saying, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. (laughs) Not done yet, is it? I thought it was done. And I find it interesting, just to me, I don't know if it means anything. He didn't criticize them for baptizing them. He criticized them for eating with them. Go ahead and let them be baptized, but don't you sit down across the table with them and show you like these folks or anything. Verse 19, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Great! Isn't that wonderful? Only if you don't read the next phrase. Speaking the word only to the Jews. Speaking the word to no one except the Jews. Verse 20. Now there were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching Jesus and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord and the report of this came to the heirs of the church of Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas. You've got to love Barnabas. To Antioch, and when he came, he was glad. Oh, good things are happening, but it's still Jews. Chapter 13. Chapter 13. This is a monumental chapter. It's in the back of your Bible, in the map section, you know? Paul's first missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas are going to go out into all the world. Finally, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and finally to the uttermost part of the earth. They're going to go everywhere, and they're going to tell everybody that God loves everybody. We call it the first missionary journey. Verse 4, so being sent out by, Holy, by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now they got it. The gospel is for all. Greeks and Jews both are in Cyprus. There are Roman military posts in Cyprus. They're going to encounter some Jewish people. It was a retirement village for Roman soldiers, I believe. But, wah, wah, wah. Verse 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They're still preaching to a Jewish audience, and that continues, and it becomes a norm. Verse 14, they go to Perga and Antioch and Pisidia on the Sabbath day. They went to the synagogue and sat down. Verse 15, after reading the law, the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, sent a message saying, if you have a word, say it. And Paul stood up and And listen to Paul's great gospel message. Remember, one the Lord has made the call through one has gone. Her sin has gone, let's go, it's grace. The gospel is for Jews, right? I mean, that's, look at it, verse 7, verse 16, Paul's message. This great gospel preacher, men of Israel. Wait a minute. What about people who aren't men of Israel? The God of Israel chose our fathers. And made the people great, the Israelites great, during the day land, stay in the land of Egypt. Verse 23, of this man, King David's offspring, God has brought Israel a Savior, Jesus. This is getting hard. We're on our way to chapter 14. So go there. At Iconium, they entered Iconium, they entered into a Jewish synagogue. And spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Gen- Greeks believe. Verse chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. I, I, I don't, 
I don't know about you, I, 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 I don't often speculate about what I would do if I was God, but I, I think if I was God at this point, I would be beating my head against one of those jasper walls in heaven, you know. I've done everything I can to get it clear to these folks, and they don't understand the gospel's for everybody. Chapter 17, they passed through Amphiblius and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, and there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his custom was, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scripture in the synagogue. He, he explained to them it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. Still Jews. Verse 10, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and they arrived and went to the Jewish synagogue. This is frustrating. <laughs> May I suggest to you that it's somewhat natural. Uh, I have, by accident, kind of, a minor in marketing. In a marketing, what's going on in these first 17 chapters is Christians are picking the low-hanging fruit. The easy ones. I, I've gone all over the country doing soul winning workshops and saying to people, go to the first to the most obvious field of endeavor. Folks that attend your service that aren't Christians. Folks that visit your service aren't members of the church. It's most obvious. If your town is known for something, reach out to the people that your town's known for because those are the people that will, you'll have the most of and the most natural. It's, it's obvious. Fast forward a little bit with me. September 16th, 1954. Dudney Field in Nashville, Tennessee, where Vanderbilt played football. It's a Friday night, and a young Billy Graham will conduct his first ever soul-winning workshop in the state of Tennessee. That night, in the stadium that would hold 27,901 people, they put lights up just for that event, first time they'd had lights at Vanderbilt Stadium. Graham preached. Prior to his preaching, his team had come in and invited all the preachers in the city, the pastors, all the preachers of any church to be counselors. And, and some of our wise brethren signed up to be counselors. And when Graham offered his invitation, they would sit down with people who had responded to Graham's invitation and tell them the Lord's invitation. They would take the good Bible teaching that Billy Graham had done that was not complete and far enough and they would say, all right, here's what you've done, now here's what the text says to do. And a lot of people became Christians as a result of hearing the message that these gospel preachers gave in that event. 20 years later, 1974, Graham will hold his second campaign, this one in Nashville, this one will be in July. It'll be a whole weekend, a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday, three nights. Dudley Field will now hold 30,000, 34,000 people. It's packed every night. And once again on that night, gospel preachers signed up to be response counselors, and they would get with the respondent, and they would teach them the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And they would pick the low-hanging fruit. I, I would say that the church across the United States and maybe around the world through the 50s and 60s and 70s flourished off this low-hanging fruit. In a modernist world where people were taught the scientific method, you show me the facts, I'll do what the facts say. And we would sit down with them over a Bible and we'd say, here's what your church has said and here's what the Bible says. Do you see a difference? And they would say, yeah, I do. And they would become Christians as they did what the Bible said. A lot of good people from denominational backgrounds loved and revered the Word of God and were shown what the Word of God said to do. They actually did it. That's what the first century Christians were doing. They were taking Jewish people who God had conditioned for generations, for centuries to be prepared for Christ, and those good Jewish people would obey the gospel. But, what do you do when the world shifts? 
What do you do when you can't go to a Jewish temple or synagogue? What do you do when no longer are your neighbors good Methodist or Baptist who believe and revere the word of God but no longer have any faith at all? What do you do when the nuns in our world outnumber the believers of our culture? Is the gospel no longer effective? Fast forward with me again. 1998, I had gotten a few preachers together for a sermon planning retreat in what the Jenkins Institute we now call sermon planning seminars. And um, we were planning our sermons for a year. We always bring in an outsider. And that year I brought John Parker, who was a, a PhD in English, an excellent gospel preacher, and an elder, a revered guy, to come in and speak. I'll never forget what he said that night. He talked about reaching lost people. And he said something that will stay with me, I think, the rest of my life. He said, are you listening? He said, sometimes we are answering questions C and D when people are asking questions A and B. We're answering questions C and D when people are asking questions A and B. Now listen, I am much more comfortable answering questions C and D. I'm much more equipped to answer questions C and D. Questions C and D are questions about scriptural worship, about baptism, about denominationalism as compared to the, to the uh, uniqueness of the Lord's church, about the authority of scripture in a person's life. Those are questions C and D. But more and more, and it's going to become even more, you already see it more and more, we're going to have, go back and have to answer questions A and B because they don't care about questions C and D yet. They don't care if we believe in Jesus or the Scriptures because they don't. They don't care about appropriate worship and about baptism and about the Lord's Supper. They don't care about those things because they don't even believe in the Bible. Those of us in the U.S. have feasted in an Acts 2 world, but our Acts 2 world has become an Acts 17 world. And an Acts 17 world needs the gospel just as much as an Acts 2 world. So what did Paul do when he found himself in Acts 17? Well, let's stay in Acts 17 and look at verse 22. Start there with me. So Paul, standing up in the midst of the Aragopolis, said, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious. As I passed among and observed the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Put a stop there, we'll come back to it. Notice what Paul did. Paul walked among them. Paul became a part of them for a short time. He, he observed them. He studied what they were like. Notice what he didn't do. He did not lash out against them. He did not tell them how horrible their pagan beliefs were and how damnable their actions were outside of Christ. He did not attack their religion on Facebook. Paul didn't even send out a mean tweet about them. In fact, he commended them as he walked where they were. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him. And yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our very being, even as your own poets had said. For we indeed are his offspring. Now watch it. He doesn't go to Acts chapter 2. He doesn't mention men of Israel or their forefathers. He, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't talk about the Jewish system. He doesn't talk about the Jewish worship. He even quotes one of their poets as an authority. 
And he does that to teach them and bring them to Jesus. Verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and the imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. You notice he hasn't mentioned worship that's decent in an order or denominationalism or even Jesus' name directly. I can assure you from the text all the way from chapter 17 backward that if he had been talking to a Jewish audience, he would have already been contrasting the Jewish religion to Christianity and talking about Jesus. I can assure you of that because that's what he did over and over again. And if we're talking to a denominational person who believes the Bible and in Jesus already, who respects this text, that's where we still ought to go. But more and more and more in our world, our neighbors who are moving in and who are growing up in homes in our neighborhoods and who we're interacting with in our schools and our ball games and our places of work and the malls and other places that we go, they're not believers in Jesus. They're not active in anything religiously. But they still need the gospel. And the question for us is, the question for me is, how long is it going to be till we start accepting Gentiles into the church? How long is it before we start going to the Gentiles of our world whose lives are so different, but who need Jesus just as much as everyone else? I sometimes wonder if if God today isn't beating his head against a celestial jasper wall at us. It's easy for us to reach out to people who are like us. Same general skin hue, same nationality, same language, same basic upbringing. But I know you're listening. And I know you know it. There are less and less people like that in our world. And that immigrant, that vagrant on the street, that person all tattooed up, that person with an alternative lifestyle, listen carefully. They're the Gentiles of our world. And they need the gospel too. And rather than walking by and wagging our head about how horrible their lifestyle is, why don't we teach them about the Lord? I want to tell you something. That person that's chasing after one thing after another, one high after another, one drug after another, one person after another, one thrill after another, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for Jesus. I, I, they don't know it. They're looking for fulfillment. And you do know it. You know the only thing that will bring them ultimate fulfillment is Jesus. They don't know what will bring them fulfillment. They're just looking for something that will find a little bit of satisfaction, a little bit of release and relief from the pain of their life, a little bit of an answer for the confusion of their life. And we have every answer. And we're still teaching Jews. We're still teaching people just like us. I'm not here today to fuss at you. Because God was mighty patient with those people in the first century. But I know what he wants us to do. He wants us to take the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The one who John wrote was full of grace and truth. And to share them with everybody. The message of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 is for us as much as it was for them. Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray that this lesson will have some impact on at least one life here today. 
that we will be energized to tell others about your son, people who are lost and need him. We're thankful that we get to enjoy being a part of your kingdom for the thrill, for the excitement, for the comfort and safety and security of being your people. What a blessing that is. But it's simple and easy for us to forget that there are many who do not enjoy that blessing. And if we enjoy it without sharing it, we are greedy people. Help us to reach lost people with your message. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening. You're dismissed.